Test, 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 test. All right. This one's not hot anymore. Sorry. It's his. Sorry. It's probably just off then. Yep. Check, check, check. All right. I think we're good. All right. So let me... Um, everybody. I'm going to ask you for one more round of applause for all the volunteers here today. So these B-Sides events are just awesome. You know, you think about the exposure, the understanding, the education you're getting um, for a almost free admission, right? The nominal ticket price, you go away with a t-shirt, all your swag is, is the stuff you bought. It's just phenomenal. And B-Sides across the country cropping up. NSA is proud to sponsor here in Augusta. Um, we do DC and Baltimore. Um, I know our folks participate in Augusta, or out in, uh, out in Texas as well. It's just a super opportunity to make sure we understand um, how we're going to secure cyberspace in, uh, in, uh, in the future. And I think the investment, you'll see young people here, experienced professionals, people who are curious. It's just awesome. So, so as I get to talk to you today, what I want to do is take you through um, a little journey and think about where technology came from and where it's going. And hopefully as we start the day, Put that back in the back of your minds so that when we're hearing all of these presentations, you got something to anchor them to, and you kind of rise up out of that and think in terms of a bigger picture. So where's technology going? What are the risks? Um, where's technology going? That's a little close to predictions. Um, predictions are hard. I think it was Niels Bohr who said, um, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future, right? So I'm really not going to try to predict too much about the future, but let you guys think about where we've been, where we're going, and then what that means. So I'm going to talk in terms of five revolutions that I've seen come through. So this, uh, this is 1970s computer technology, right? Computers were owned by industry. They were owned by government. They're owned by educational institutions, right? They were such a scarce commodity that they were timeshared. You had to make an appointment. You had to submit a batch job, but you got a piece of that resource, and it was a scarce resource, and most people didn't have access to it. So, so, so that's the lineage. That's where this has grown up from. Fast forward to the PC revolution. 1977, things started growing in the personal computer revolution. They really became home computers in the 80s. But this is the point where the masses could have this. People could understand and start to learn for themselves. They could tinker. They could play. They could evaluate and understand and learn by doing. Right? You didn't have to go to a formal course. You didn't have to have that special access to something that was institutional. Um, but it really opened the door for masses to get into this next revolution. Right? So first revolution, personal computer. Second revolution, um, and, and I'm cheating, I'm getting a twofer here, because I'm really talking about the internet and the World Wide Web, which are intertwined, interlinked, but different. Um, if you look at the internet, 
um, the connectivity, the, the way this rolled out, um, you now brought information from across the globe and brought it into the homes, into the hands of people. So if you, if you think about the internet, the, the time frames on the internet are very short. So as we get going, sorry, let me put up my speaker's notes. Make sure I'm catching the right dates here. So as you look at the revolutions in terms of the, the connectivity, exponential growth, a thousand machines connected in 1984, that was the institutional period, right? That was university to university, government research lab to government research lab. By 92, we had a million computers connected. Uh, that's really a, a tipping point where people started to get access broadly to the internet. By 2008, we hit a billion machines. I'm sorry, I'm not driving the slides from here. So I'm going to pull the connectivity and just run it myself. Did it, did it lock Restart up? Restart it. Uh, From the beginning. No, I want, to, I want to be able to run over and grab it. Okay. Apologies for all the IT tech stuff. That's the beauty of going first. We came in and tested, but I didn't test with the recording. Um, so I'm going to reopen this. Presenter's view? Yes. Well, I'm trying to have it up. So we're out of sync with the outside piece. One last run. All right, throw me back up. Still seeing your yep, slideshow. All right, we're good to go now. I apologize. All right. So if you look at that astronomic growth of the connected machines, you're also seeing huge growth in connected users. 95, we had 35 million users. Um, 2015, 3 billion users. Today, we've got 3.4 billion people on the internet. There's, there's about 7.4 billion people on the planet, right? Almost half the planet's on the internet. So there's a, there's a research professor, Metcalf, talked about Metcalf's law, says, that the value of a telecommunication network is proportional to the square of the number of users on that system, right? This growth, when you double the people, you don't val double the value of that network. We're squaring its exponential growth as we add people to this network. Think about the internet and the type of things you do with it, right? A lot of us have niche interests. Think about eBay. eBay started as a place somebody wanted to sell their Pez dispensers, right? They started up eBay. 
Um, and, and it flourished. They found Pez dispensers around the world, people who collected that small, niche, odd sp thing, and they connected them. But then other people found it, and you know everything from electronics to glassware to other stuff. But you could find people around the globe who participated in your small community. The same thing grew up in terms of information. If you wanted to know about something small and specialized, you can have somebody dive so deep that they understand the nits, the tiny bits of that technology, and it was accessible to you through the internet. Think about those of us who are involved in programming, right? If you have a question on a routine, on a, you need a snippet of code, you need to find out why something's failing. Maybe your, your PowerPoint's not running right, right? You can go out to that internet, you can, you can hit the Google, it will bring back somebody else who has dealt with that issue before you, right? The power of that information coming to you um, is exceptional. Third revolution, I'd say cell phone. If you think about where the iPhone, right, has impacted the technology of this country, right, uh, it, it's just phenomenal that you can be connected to all the power of that internet all across the land, anywhere you go, day, night, it brings it to you, the world in your pocket. Right? So June 2007, that was the start of the iPhone. Right? It wasn't even 10 years ago, and the first instanti instantiation of the iPhone wasn't that awesome, but it quickly grew to the power of the apps, leveraging the internet. Right. And now you've got the sum total of the world's knowledge walking around with you in your pocket, connected all the time with a GPS, a video system, with um, microphones, with the ability to interact with the world coming through that small device, right? That was a huge revolution built on those previous pieces um, that now brings more power to you. Remember I said it took a number of years to get to a billion machines connected through the internet. Uh, 2015, there were almost 8 billion mobile devices connected to that internet. Again, growth curve continues exponentially, but now that connection goes with you, right? So the power of the multiplication of all of those things on top of... Uh, on top of the information that they bring to you, radically changing lives. Um, if you look at the global mobile traffic, it grew 74% again in 2015. Um, gl global mobile data reached 3.7 exabytes a month in 2015. So an exabyte is a million terabytes. Um, the folks that do the research have said that five exabytes would cover and record every spoken word said since the beginning of human history, right? If you transcribed every spoken word throughout the, the totality of human history, um, that's equivalent to the amount of data that's now flowing over the mobile networks today in 2016 in a month, right? So, so massive usage of this, massive, massive volumes, but it's the connectivity, the information it brings, and the enabling it does. So I'd submit the fourth revolution is cloud computing, right? So it's the, it's the big data back ends that are now making that smartphone or your home PC, but that smartphone in your pocket bring the power of analytics, data, together in a fused way so that you can ask questions of that data and it will bring you answers that are distributed, are able to scale to the level that we've got billions of people who want to go out to that messaging app or to go to that GPS crowdsourced thing that will tell you when the traffic's bad and reroute you around it automatically before you encounter it. Right? All of the things that can be put into, stirred up, and then asked questions of um, come with the power of that cloud computing. And so really what that means is Anywhere, anytime, you can get access to that data, which is everything, everywhere, right? I would submit to you that these revolutions, these technologies are culturally changing our, our, uh, our society, right? Seven years ago, that iPhone bit flipped. 
you walk outside during the breaks and look at the number of people who are interacting to and through that device. Maybe down a little bit as people worry about their devices and a crew like you. Um, some people might not have them out and on, but as you go to the airport, the shopping mall, right? Look at the people walking like this or maybe flicking on their Pokemon Go, but they're interacting through this. You can check your bank account, right? You can message your kids. You can know your home security status. You know, there's, there's things online coming through this that direct your life, whether it be that GPS app or warning you um, that, that the smoke alarm's gone off in your house, right? That connectivity is massive. Um, so, so I said, you know, culturally changing. When I grew up, um, UFOs were a big thing, right? There were TV shows about them. There were books about them. You'd read about them in mainstream magazines. There were people alleging the government was hiding UFO information from the public. Uh, there were grainy photographs every once in a while of a thing somebody said was a UFO. Now there's billions of video cameras on everybody's pockets, walking around, filming car accidents. Just You go to YouTube and you see once-in-a-lifetime kind of things happening, just bizarre stuff that happened to have a camera in front of it. Where'd those UFOs go, man? Culturally changing, right? We're not seeing that anymore. So the fifth revolution I would hold up is really the Internet of Things concept. Um, 2009, people started talking about Internet of Things. Uh, it's really taken off. By 2020, Cisco's saying two-thirds of the things connected to the mobile Internet will be some sort of device. They won't have a person at the under, other end of it, right? It'll be device-based. Huh. It was, it's, it's about 15, 18% today. What's driving the Internet of Things? Anybody recognize what this is? Wow. Raspberry Pi. So a guy in England said, I want to teach more kids to do computers. Uh, he invested in, sponsored, um, built a company that could could make computing affordable to the masses, kind of that next level of it's at an institution, it's a home computer, but there's still even a barrier um, to be able to tinker and play and understand with that technology. So, so the investment they made brought um, Raspberry Pi, $35 computer, um, hugely powerful, multiprocessor. It's got hardware inputs and outputs so people can tinker and learn how to physically interface with a computer. Um, it's got the connectivity to attach devices, whether it's displays, mice, keyboards, cameras, other things. Um, but it is, um, it, it was possible because of that chip in the center, which is a system on a chip, which takes all of the things that were discrete pieces of computers and jams them onto one piece of silicon. And when you can jam it onto one thing, you can drive and focus on the manufacturing costs and drive that down cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So, so much of the cost really isn't in the computer itself of that computer. It's in all the connectivity that lets us interact with it. It's those big connectors. It's the interfaces that get out to the real world. Uh, so the founder of the Raspberry Pi organization was talking to Eric Schmidt of Google. And he said, what are you doing next? And they talked about more powerful, bigger, badder computers for the kids to learn on, things for experimenters to play with. And uh, Google said, I think you got it wrong, right? I think you've got to get it to the point where you can give them away. That's your intention is everybody needs to have a computer, learn about a computer, make it accessible, get that on the Internet um, figure from half the world to the whole world. And they scratched their heads and said, well, I can't give it away. And if anybody knows free, it's really Google, right? They give away Gmail and the Android operating system and all of those things. Um, so, so it was probably thoughtful, reasonable advice. And this is what came out of that effort, right? This is um, a Google Pi Zero. And I don't know if the name is intended to mean zero cost, but it's five bucks. It's a, it's a slightly reduced version of that same computer. Uh, you'll notice a lot less connectors. They drove down the cost for the connectors. Um, it's got one 
um, CPU slice in that processor instead of a quad processor. Um, but it's still an impressive machine. It's a really impressive machine. Runs full-blown Linux. It will um, play Minecraft. It'll run a, it'll run a web server. Um, it will, through connectivity, I use these things. I can go out and control thousands of LEDs for a Christmas light show off that one CPU. Uh, it, it is an amazingly powerful computer. And in fact, that computer has more compute cycles than that room I showed you from the 70s. It has way more compute power than those first home PCs I showed you, which were useful devices. And it's five bucks. And in fact, uh, is there a micro center in Atlanta? How about, what's the closest one here, Atlanta? Um, so micro week had them for 99 cents, right? Um, the, the, the cost of this is still in that board and that connector. Um, and what they've done is they've pushed that computer down onto that system on a chip. But, but it wasn't built for the Pi Zero. It was built for the Internet of Things stuff that's coming out. And the, 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 the Pi folks said, this is the right chip for us to use at this point in time. So what it says to me is that small computer is going to get into more and more and more things connected to the Internet, running substantial compute power at the end node, um, communicating and being able to drive um, all sorts of innovation, right? Seven years ago, the iPhone didn't exist. I couldn't have imagined the things I'd be using it for today, right? And so I can't tell you all the things that, you know, a, a 60 cent chip is going to do um, for the automation and sophistication of the things that are going to be in our lives. Um, so, so to kind of give you an example of where that, where that's going, where that's heading, um, let me show you the power of the distributed global cloud based internet on a mobile phone. All right, so if there's anybody in here who already knows it, you can't play. So there's a pie. Um, I'll run a quick contest. So I'll give away a pie and a power supply and, a, and, and a, an adapter and the other pieces to make it run. If anybody can tell me what year NSA was founded. Right. So I said, if you know, you can't play. So who can figure it out? All right. I see the phones going up. The, Google, the Googles are lighting up. All right, what you got? 1952, come on down. So President Truman set up NSA 1952 with an executive order. There you go. So here's a pie and the stuff that'll make it run. All right, thanks. Yes, sir, thank you. All right, so, so quick example, right? He didn't know small, tiny, trivial piece of knowledge. If you had that question in this room 10 years ago, right, uh, you'd have to go to the library. You'd have to make some calls. You may never know, right? It may not be worth it for you to know. But that's the power of grabbing all of that information and having it at your fingertips, right? How many times a day does that event repeat over and over where you can leverage that chain of technology to get to the things you need in your, in, in your life? So Internet of Things 2020, if you go out and talk to the, you know, the, the prognosticators about technology, they'll give you widely varying views of where we're going to be. Uh, but if you talk to Gartner, if you read the Cisco reports and other things, pretty reasonable. You'll get ranges 20 to 50 billion devices connected to the networks. Um, 200, 300 billion sensor-enabled objects, things that, you know, know about the physical world, compute on them, and then, uh, and then do something with that information, right? Huge, huge leverage. And this is going to be that same exponential growth. More things connected mean more stuff. That's going to happen. Uh, I'll tell you, um, much to the chagrin of my wife, 
right? I am an early adopter. I expect many folks in here are early adopters as well, right? So I, I have an IoT device jury rigged up to my, my uh, washing machine and dryer. And every time that that is done, I get a tweet, right? I, or not a tweet, I get a text. Says, laundry's done. Reminds me to put it in the dryer. Dryer's done. Get it out so it doesn't wrinkle. Life changing? Nope. Convenient? Absolutely, right? <laughs> Pretty geeky? Yes, I admit. All right. But, but the idea that, you know, I could put something reasonably affordable and I could do that with the technology, um, I, I didn't write a line of code to do that, right? I grabbed piece parts um, that exist and then messed with some interfaces and it was there. And, and you know, soon it will continue um, to grow and grow and things will be connected and available and, and, and doing these kind of things in the background the same way that, you know, my kids will never be lost in their entire lifetime unless their battery died, right? They're, they're going to have this always on information. There's going to be this stuff in the background of your life that you can't predict yet. Uh, that's going to keep us moving. It was awesome here. Somebody trying the Hey Siri, right? Calling it up. Uh, I said five revolutions. I'm cheating. You might be getting in on the six here. Uh, Voice-enabled technology is, is is a real enabling piece of all of this. So that's uh, an Amazon dot. Um, it's the Amazon Echo in a smaller form factor, but this is Amazon's device that you talk to. It's always listening. Alexa, can you tell me when NSA was, was formed? Alexa, can you turn on the lights? Right? Alexa, set temperature to 62. And it talks to these devices that are networked enabled, and it manipulates your physical environment around you. Uh, if you think back to those revolutions I was talking about, that machine room, you submitted punch cards to interact with that computer. Maybe it was a stored program, but it was something very manual, keyboards to enter the data. Mice is the next level of input, touchpads on those phones, uh, but now you're talking to them. So as there's small computers sprinkled around the environment around you, I mentioned those connectors are a big part of the cost of things. Um, if there's one thing in your environment that can just listen to you and then talk in terms of the ones and zeros that have to get in and out of those devices, uh, you've again reduced the cost of that interaction enormously and that one thing can communicate with all the things and can keep that moving and manipulating for you. So huge leverage and power in here. So Siri um, coming online a, a few years ago, the Amazon Echo. Um, so Siri 2011, Amazon Echo 2014. Uh, big shifts, and they're getting better and better if any of you have used them. And, and it's just phenomenal the amount of mobile queries that are coming to, um, to Google across its interface that are no longer typed. Right. Sometimes it's in the car, so your hands free. But I watch a lot of people now um, who are just starting to dictate their emails or dictate their queries um, because you can do it faster and almost as accurately through the voice interface as you can with the keyboard. All the things, right? It's going to be pervasive and around us. I, I couldn't even predict. You know, you take away the technology you carried in here, the laptops, the, the phones, the things you've got in your back backpacks for a B-sides. Take away those things, and I would expect there are hundreds of CPUs in this room, right? Hundreds between all of the IT, the video teleconferencing, the alarm systems, you know, and, and all of this. Um, and, and as we go on and on in the next couple of years, you know, I couldn't predict the way the mobile phone, smartphone would change society in the last seven. Um, what are these connected things going to do in the next five to ten? So since this is a B-Sides conference, this is where we got to go. <laughs> we start with small Linux computers that are sprinkled around your environment, right? Who's patched their IoT device this week? 
I haven't patched my washing machine. My, my, I haven't patched my washing machine sensor this week, right? Um, so, so the question is: as we get pervasive computers in our lives, and they are expected to do things um, that we trust, right? Your alarm system, that baby monitor, that uh, that security camera. That internet-connected um, uh, sensor for your uh, for your fire alarm. Uh, the question is, what latent bugs or defects are in them, or you know, how will the technology advance? Right. I, I spent some money to get that dryer connected. If there's a better solution in two years and this one's working, am I going to switch it out for a more secure dryer sensor? I'm not. Right? So these things are going to be baked into the fabric of our lives. And then in the process of people poking at them and prodding at them, we're going to find these bugs. And they're going to be vulnerabilities in our space and our lives. So why do we care? Um, if you think about it, the cyber environment today, it's where our nation stores its wealth and treasure. Um, the treasure being our intellectual property. Right? You read about the hacking losses that companies have suffered where people have stolen that intellectual property and gone and recreated something that they invested billions in to research and develop. And now somebody gets that fruits of their labor for free and can bring that online, not having invested in that, and reap the rewards on the other side. And then there's just the wealth. Um, you know, our bank accounts, our stock markets, and other things. And so we've got to ensure that we're protecting that in that space. Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber interviewed. Why do you rob banks, Willie? Why? That's where the money is. That's where the money is, right? And so now we've put our money out into that cyber environment. We, we've also made it so we can't live without it at times, right? Um, huge, just fascinating. Um, I, I won't go down that road here, but if you want to be impressed, look at the business cycle that's growing up around the crypto locker um, trade. They have whole organizations with research and development funds who are looking at ways of grabbing viruses, permuting them, look, uh, redeploying them with the purpose of ransomware on your PCs and machines, right? The, Machine pops up and said, "You've been hacked. Send bitcoins to this account, and we'll unlock your we'll unlock your things." Well, what happens when that's your car, and you know that little mobile data center has to be unlocked for you to get to work? Right? You're going to pay that ransom because you've got no other choice um, to get in there. So, so where we're st storing our treasure, our wealth, and maybe even relying on these things, um, that's a very big deal. So I made you think a little bit about you know, the, the sensors and the threats in the environment. There's a whole bunch of ways that if you're running a big business or you're, you're responsible for securing something, you've got to worry about the threats in that space. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit of a story to make you think again about where those threats come from. Um, personal story, um, air conditioner, much like Augusta, up in Maryland, hot, humid, really nasty summers. Rely on those air conditioners tremendously. So one morning, woke up, seemed especially hot and steamy. Uh, went down, clicked the thermostat down. Um, it says the thermostat, thermostat says the, the furnace should, the air conditioner should be running. Cranked it down, fans running, no cool air. Great. Head to the basement, check out the air conditioner unit in the house. Everything seems functioning. It's working. It's spinning the fans. Um, but the, the, the pipes inside that should be chilling the air aren't cold. Heading outside. Go outside, check. Uh, the external unit is not spinning. So I, I know enough to check. Is it supplying the signal from the inside? Yes. Is it supplying the signal and getting there to the outside? Yep. Check. Uh, but it's not running. Is there AC there? Yep. All right, you've reached the limit of my technology. Call the repair guy. 
a repair guy comes to the house. He starts working on the, uh, the air conditioning unit. Uh, after about 15 minutes, he says, it's the, it's the power company's box that you've affixed to the outside of your air conditioner that cycles on heavy duty days has failed. I can't replace it. You'll have to call the power company. So I, our power company has this program where they put connected devices on the outside compressors and on peak load days you get a break on your power if you sign up for the program and they can cycle them off maybe 15 to 30 minutes during peak loads and shed some of that power. Uh, they do that to manage the overall electrical draw at peak times and kind of smooth it out. Um, you get a benefit, hopefully you don't notice, but they drive down your electric costs if you put those in. I never put it in. I didn't sign up for it. I didn't know the freaking thing was there, right? So I had bought the house. Previous owner, I guess, had signed up for the service. I didn't want it. I like being cool. I don't want to trust my cool to somebody else's decisions. So I didn't sign up. But this thing was sitting on my air conditioner, and it failed, and it failed open. I didn't even know it was there. So um, I told the guy, I don't care about getting it fixed. I want it gone pull it out, jump around it, get me my air conditioning, and he did. So 15 minutes later, I was, I was fixing up. But I tell you this story because my question is, do you know when you're vulnerable? I didn't even know I was vulnerable. I didn't know that was part of my local system and environment. I didn't know I had the vulnerability or the risk, but it was there. And so when that failed, it took me down. I had, I had an air conditioning DDoS, and I wasn't happy. Right, but but it showed me that you know I didn't know my my environment well enough to defend it. Right, I didn't know to look at that thing. Um, you know, in hindsight, if I knew it was there and knew what it did, <coughs> I would have known enough to be able to look around it, and that was within my means to to be back up and running. But I didn't even know it was there. So so why do I tell you that story? Because I've really learned over time one of the core fundamental things to defending a network is really knowing your network. You can't defend what you do not know. So I would ask you, you know, as you push a red team at a network, or as you have foreign adversaries coming in, as you have criminals trying to do that crypto locker, um, that ransomware on you, Right. The question is, who knows more? Who's going to put in the time to know the pieces and the parts? Who's going to know the devices and the vulnerabilities? Who's going to know the things that underlie that system? Who's going to know about the one user that really, no kidding, has kind of jumpered over your security thing for convenience so they can get to the, the website they want to go that your, uh, that your security system is not letting them get to? Uh, you know, who's going to plug in that thumb drive? Who's going to know that that IoT thing that was built in 2016 but is still in the network in 2024 um, has a really well-known open CVE against it, right? So who knows the most? And I will tell you the people that are looking to take advantage of you and your things are going to put in the time to find that one thing to exploit it. And, and so that's the reality of what we're up against when we have to consider how to defend these things. So as we connect all the things, as we use technology that's unlikely to be moved out, to be unlikely to be patched on a regular basis, and unlikely at times to even be understood that it's in the environment and introducing a vulnerability, I would say um, you know, we really need to focus in on the technologies, the policies, and the advancements all the way across the spectrum, right? Whether it's education, um, doing that advanced research to figure out new and innovative ways that these vulnerabilities aren't liabilities, whether it's the government that gets better policies in place that are going to help us secure at a national level, whether it be industry who thinks about how a 10-year-old product that they don't want to support anymore 
really can still be a liability to the customers that they sold them to and figure out a way that we can continue to maintain and understand and maybe automatically update so I don't have to know when I got to upgrade my washer sensor. Right? So thinking about that and setting up that ecosystem um, really is a challenge for the technologists, the folks in here, the, the, the research community, um, and the industry partners. Right? We can't rush out, um, be the first to market with the great thing everybody's got to have, knowing that there's, a, that, that there's a fundamental security design from the ground up. So I'll wrap it up here. Again, thanks for the invite. Uh, just leave you again with one last thought about vulnerabilities. You know, the guy that won the, the Raspberry Pi took it from the NSA guy. It really is just a Raspberry Pi. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Thank you for your time and attention.